information, this PowerPoint is on the BRIMS webpage. Uh, Brian Gober made this for us. It's got some pretty good information. It probably takes less than an hour to watch with some videos on capnography, uh, IGEL, and King Airway insertion. I recommend going to that. The reason we are doing it this way here is hopefully to record it, so add a few more tidbits of information on there, and we'll post this to our uh, YouTube channel and also the BRIMS webpage. Okay, so obviously there were some pages, numbers changed, not a big deal. This is the cool slide. So OG tubes are for paramedics. We've got blind insertion devices and capnography for EMTs. I know that the new guys coming out of EMT training are getting some of this into uh, initial education, but for you guys who have been EMTs for a while, blind insertion devices are new and capnography is definitely new. There's no way you can learn it and understand it by one class. You're going to have to reach out and do some things with that. BiPAP, which is like fancy CPAP we'll talk about a little bit. Uh, new IO site for PEDS, that'll be the distal femur. We can practice that uh, on adult cadavers in September. And then BIADS for pediatrics are now category A as well, very improved. There's a new hemodialysis uh, access uh, uh, protocol we can talk about. And then uh, chest decompression site has changed, and we'll talk about when you can do that. So we'll keep on moving. So OG tube placement, that's the big thing for paramedics. Next slide. So OG tubes are great. They do a couple of things. Uh, they're a double lumen tube. It's got a, uh, several larger holes that can suck out chunks out of somebody's belly. And it's got a smaller hole as well. So when you get the suction, it doesn't attach to the stomach or the esophagus and cause damage. These are great airway devices, okay? Let's hit the next slide, Chief. So the way these things work, what I do in the hospital, if I'm gonna intubate somebody and I can't get them on first pass and I'm using a BVM, I put an oral airway in them, all right? And then I slide an OG tube. And if you look, the OG tube will fit around the ET tube it goes into the stomach. It decompresses the stomach. When you think about aspiration, people think you get an ET tube in somebody and the cuff is up and you can't aspirate. You actually can. You can get liquid that goes around that cuff, right? So if you have somebody that's in cardiac arrest, has no muscle tone, you're doing chest compressions, you get vomit back, right? You put an OG tube in there and hook that to suction or even hook it to air, you're going to limit the risk of aspiration for these people. It makes a big difference if you get ROSC. In kids, an NG tube or an OG tube is an airway management device. Remember, kids, <clears throat> no matter how well you bag them, you're going to get air in the belly. The air, the belly gets big. It pushes up on the diaphragm. It decreases the amount of lung space you have to ventilate. You put an OG tube in there, and that releases that pressure in the belly. You can bag them up, and you can work pretty good. So OG tubes are great. So medics can now do these, okay? Anybody I intubate in the ER gets an OG tube. They don't do this in the OR before elective surgeries a lot of times, because why? They've been nothing to eat or drink past midnight, right? They're already dry, their belly is empty. That's not the case of our people. We have people that have been drinking beer, eating Crystal Burgers all day, right? So OG tubes are great devices, sweet. The other thing is the BIADS for the EMT. Uh, this is fantastic. So a uh, uh, BIAD, blind insertion airway device, either the King or the IGEL. If you like the LMA or the air track, whatever you like is fine. Uh, I'm an IGEL fan. I've been using that for the past couple of years, but either way, it makes it a lot easier to ventilate somebody. You know, uh, we all learned at our EMT training that uh, oral airway in a BVM is a great way to do it. In reality, if you don't do that every day, at the first few minutes you're bagging somebody, probably isn't that great unless you got two people. You got to have a great seal with those things, and then you got to have somebody in the bag for you. With the blind insertion devices, it's a whole lot easier. So next slide, and this skip this slide. Sorry, and just watch that one right there. We're going to watch the uh, insertion. Yep, that's it. Yes, sir. And I know videos get kind of dull, but I think this is probably the best way to do it um, in a group setting. In reality, y'all should. The iGel is a novel and innovative supraglottic airway management device made of a medical grade thermoplastic elastomer which is soft, gel-like and transparent. It took over five years of development to perfect a non-inflatable anatomical seal of the pharyngeal, laryngeal and perilaryngeal structures that would reduce compression trauma. A supraglottic airway without an inflatable cuff has several potential advantages including easier insertion, minimal risk of tissue compression and stability after insertion. iGel is a latex-free single patient use device 
that has a gastric channel to reduce the risk of aspiration. Key components and their function. The soft non-inflatable gel-like cuff matches the shape and softness of the laryngeal and perilaryngeal framework. It helps to that provide easy you see there, guys, and rapid insertion a and reduces channel. the potential so that of post-operative right the the trauma. Can get vomit An integral gastric channel is provided to reduce the risk of aspiration and allow for passing of a nasogastric tube. The buccal cavity stabilizer eliminates the potential for rotation and aids insertion. An epiglottic rest helps to prevent the epiglottis from downfolding or obstructing the distal opening of the airway. The 15mm connector extends inside the airway tube far enough to provide an integral bite block. Pre-insertion preparation. Eye gel is supplied in a sterile pouch enclosed in either a protective cradle or a cage pack. This innovative packaging is color-coded for size and designed to ensure the device is maintained in the correct flexion prior to use. It also acts as a base for lubrication. Select the appropriate size eye gel according to patient weight. When selecting size, it should be remembered that the eye gel cuff does look smaller than the corresponding size of many traditional supraglottic airways with an inflatable cuff. Ensuring that you conform to local policy for hygiene, open the eye gel package and take out the protective cradle or cage pack containing the device. In the final minute of pre-oxygenation, remove the eye gel and place a small bolus of a water-based lubricant, such as KY jelly, onto the middle of the smooth surface of the cradle or cage back in preparation for lubrication. Do not use silicon-based lubricants. Grasp the eye gel with the opposite free hand along the integral bite block and lubricate the back, sides and front of the cuff with a thin layer of lubricant. This process may be repeated if lubrication is not adequate. After lubrication has been completed, check that no bolus of lubricant remains in the bowl of the cuff or elsewhere on the device. Avoid touching the cuff of the device with your hands. Place the eye gel back into the protective cradle or cage pack in preparation for insertion. Do not place the device onto the pillow or chest of the patient. Always use the protective cradle or cage pack. Do not use unsterile gauze to help in lubricating the device. Do not apply lubricant too long before insertion. And always ensure dentures or plates are removed from the mouth before attempting insertion. The eye gel must always be separated from the protective cradle or cage pack prior to use. These are not introducers and must never be inserted into the patient's mouth. Insertion technique. A proficient user can achieve insertion in less than five seconds. Remove the eye gel from the protective cradle or cage pack. Grasp the lubricated eye gel firmly along the integral bite block. Position the device so that the eye gel cuff outlet is facing towards the chin of the patient. The patient should be in the sniffing the morning air position with head extended and neck flexed. The chin should be gently pressed down before proceeding to insert. Introduce the leading soft tip into the mouth of the patient in a direction towards the hard palate. So this is the key to glide the device downwards and backwards along the hard palate with a continuous but gentle push until a definitive resistance is felt. Do not apply excessive force on the device during insertion. It is not necessary to insert fingers or thumbs into the patient's mouth during the process of insertion. If there is early resistance during insertion, a jaw thrust or insertion with deep rotation is recommended. 
When inserted to a definitive resistance, the tip of the eye gel should be located into the upper esophageal opening and the cuff should be located against the laryngeal framework. The incisors should be resting on the integral bite block. The eye gel has a horizontal line on the integral bite block to indicate the optimal position of the teeth. But the teeth may rest safely anywhere on the integral bite block. The eye gel should then be taped down maxilla to maxilla. When inserting the eye gel, it should be remembered that partial resistance and then a feeling of give way may sometimes be felt before the end point resistance is met. This is due to the passage of the bowl of the eye gel through the foreshell pillars. This is quite normal and consistent with correct insertion, but in such cases, insertion needs to continue until definitive resistance is felt. Let's look at some eye gel insertions in real patients. Note the sniffing the morning air position and the gentle press down on the chin. See how there is no need for fingers to be inserted in the mouth. There is never a need to apply excessive force or to repeatedly push down on the device once definitive resistance has been felt. How to use the gastric channel. If required, a nasogastric tube can be inserted down the gastric channel of the eye gel. For a quick and efficient insertion, it is important that the nasogastric tube and the gastric channel of the eye gel have been adequately lubricated before insertion is attempted. The ideal way to achieve this is to place a small bolus of lubricant over the proximal end of the gastric channel. The nasogastric tube should then be inserted a short way down the channel and moved in and out to prime it before completing insertion. The maximum size of nasogastric tube that can be inserted down the eye gel is size 10 French gauge for a size 1.5, 12 French gauge for a size 2, 2.5, 3 and 4, and a size 14 French gauge for a size 5 eye gel. In summary, eye gel is a simple and effective alternative to traditional supraglottic airway devices. So, eye gel is one device eye gel has been designed to use. We can go to the next slide too if you want to, sir. The, um, Talks about lubricating with KY jelly. Some of the packs that you can buy come with KY jelly and a tube tamer. You really don't need that. Most of the people that we intubate or have to bag, they got vomit in their mouth. I've never used the KY. I put two in the other day in the ER. Most of the time there's enough self lubricant there. Those things work pretty good. You can put them in from the left side of the patient, the right side or from the head. There's really, this is super easy. And y'all heard me talk about how using a video laryngoscope is easy to intubate somebody. This is even easier, okay? Slides in pretty quick and easy. The good thing about this as well is if you saw, remember from the picture that the, uh, the part that kind of goes over the glottic opening also kind of includes the esophagus so you don't get chumps coming up around it. Now you will get liquid. That's why you can put that uh, OG tube in there as well. That's a very small gastric tube that slides in there. Uh, so if you decide to pop it, <laughs> danger, Will Robinson. But it sounded like, didn't it? Uh, sweet. Uh, uh, no, let's don't do this one. Just move on through. Once you place the uh, perfect, yeah, that's the guy that was narrating. That's what it reminded me of, anyway. <laughs> so uh, once you place the eye gel, okay, you confirm it like you do ET tubes for the paramedics that will be teaching the EMTs where you work. That's the key thing. You can confirm tube placement with this, okay? Obviously not in the trachea, but it's overlaying the glottic opening. You should get gas exchange. You should see CO2. So you slide that in, you put your waveform capnography on it for your monitor, you should see waveform capnography, okay? You actually, I, I see a better capnography of this than I do with Kings. Um, the oxygenation for this, when you ventilate and you squeeze the bag, you can't oxygenate them, but remember it's cupless and it's not in the trachea, so sometimes it kind of pushes back away from that glottic opening. So if they have bad pulmonary edema, if they've aspirated, 
If they have lung disease, COPD, sometimes it's tough to oxygenate them, okay? But you can usually ventilate people pretty good. So you'll see waveform capnography, all right? The other thing I recommend is if you have a viral filter in today's world, after you put your capnography, you put your viral filter, and then your AMBU bag, and you ventilate them with that. So, sweet. Next slide. All right, so capnography is the next thing for basic EM for EMTs. Uh, it's a big step up. That is part of the national core curriculum for EMTs now. Uh, again, the medics of the stations, you need to kind of help your EMTs out to understand this. There's no way you can get it in an eight minute video, uh, uh, but make sure you work with those guys, okay? Next slide. We'll watch this video here, and this should be our last one I'll make you watch. The guy doing this is now the uh of gyms. A great guy, get a chance to go to the gym conference. There are numerous videos on YouTube. Recommend it, especially at the EMT level. You had none of this in training until this year. Hi, welcome to Fire Engineering Training Minutes. I'm Mike McAvoy, and in this episode, I'm going to talk about using a device to measure exhaled carbon dioxide from a patient, referred to as waveform capnography. Capnography has long been present at the paramedic and advanced EMT level and is now included in the new EMS educational standards at the EMT basic level or EMT level and above. This device is an ALS monitor that also measures waveform capnography. Waveform capnography can be used on spontaneously breathing patients, like our patient here, or on patients who are being mechanically ventilated through an endotracheal tube or other advanced airway. We'll show you a picture of that later. Or it can be used on a patient who you're manually ventilating with a bag valve mask. We'll start with a spontaneously breathing patient. We're going to use a nasal cannula type device that's designed to trap exhaled air and to measure the end tidal or exhaled carbon dioxide from the patient. It has a normal nasal cannula that sits in the nose, loops around the ears, and this particular device also has a little mouthpiece that comes down and captures air that's exhaled out of the mouth. Now that the device is on the patient, we'll attach it to the monitor. When you plug it into the monitor, one of the keys to obtaining a good waveform from the patient's breathing is to be certain that the device is screwed into the port on the monitor properly. So it twists and you wanna twist it until you feel it firmly seated inside of the port on the monitor. Once it's attached, it will begin to show a waveform that actually is measuring the breathing rate of the patient and the carbon dioxide. And so what we're seeing here is a waveform that represents carbon dioxide that's coming out of the patient's mouth and nose. And there are two components to the waveform. One is the height of the waveform, which actually corresponds to the measured amount of carbon dioxide the patient is exhaling. And the other is the length of the waveform itself, which corresponds to the rate at which the patient is breathing. In this case, we see a rate displayed as 17 for breaths per minute, and we see 42 for the end tidal carbon dioxide. And normal carbon dioxide range in a healthy patient spans between 35 and 45 millimeters of mercury. If the patient was to breathe quickly, one of the things that we would see, we'll ask the patient to breathe rapidly. One of the things that we'll see in the waveform is that it will pick up its pace. As it picks up its pace, it also lowers the amount of carbon dioxide that the patient's exhaling with each breath because he's eliminating carbon dioxide at a much faster rate. So we see a waveform that's much less high and faster across the screen. This is a classic hyperventilation situation. Now if we ask the patient to breathe slower, what we'll see on the waveform is a longer length waveform and eventually this number 34 will start to increase to a higher value representing more carbon dioxide being exhaled with each breath because the patient's retaining carbon dioxide. If the patient was to stop breathing and we could ask our patient to hold his breath, 
what we'll notice is that this waveform will become a flat line. And after a certain period of time, depending on the device that you have connected, it will actually alarm. With this device that we're using here, we'll get that alarm after about 30 seconds of the patient not exchanging any air or not exhaling any carbon dioxide. That is a much faster response than you would see from pulse oximetry, which could take as long as five to 10 minutes to actually reflect a drop in oxygen in the patient. You'll see a change in 10 seconds when you're using exhaled carbon dioxide as a measurement of your patient's respiratory status. So the next piece that I would like to show you is what would happen to a patient if they were intubated and breathing through an advanced airway device. In a patient who's mechanically ventilated, the waveform capnography is a mandatory piece of equipment that should be in the line between the endotracheal tube in the patient and the bag valve mask. The device is an adapter that fits over the tube and then connects to the bag valve mask and measures the exhaled carbon dioxide through a side stream piece that actually draws the carbon dioxide into the monitor. Having the adapter in the tube between the bag valve mask and the tube itself allows us to see the waveform and tell whether the tube is actually in the trachea. One of the most common points for a tube to become dislodged is with patient movement. You notice that this patient has a cervical collar on and most EMS systems require paramedics to place a cervical collar on any patient with an artificial airway to prevent the possibility of the tube being dislodged. That's not enough, however. It's mandatory to have monitoring continuously of the waveform to make sure that not only is the patient videos. Thanks for not throwing things at me. I appreciate it. I wanted to get at least some of this recorded and out there. We won't be doing any videos for future classes as well. These videos are online at BRIM's webpage for the folks out there in internet land. If you're an EMT or you want a refresher, there are several videos in this slideshow that's on our webpage. I recommend doing that, okay? Uh, things to think about that he mentioned, uh, post-intubation, waveform capnography. Can we switch you back to where I can draw on it too, sir? Sorry. Post intubation, everybody gets waveform capnography. I know some agencies have those litmus, the easy caps. That's fine if you want to do that while you're getting your monitor warmed up, but you got to have waveform capnography to document intubations and now blind insertion devices because that really is a kind of an intubation, okay? It's pretty quick and easy to do, uh, but that confirms you actually are ventilating the patient and keeps you out of trouble, keeps the patient out of trouble as well. The other thing I would add is that post intubation, or post using a blind insertion device, you put your capnography, and then the next thing you put on there is you put on a filter if you have one. So if you've got ET tube, you put your capnography, then you put your filter, then your AMVU bag. If you do it opposite, it's gonna filter out, may mess up your waveform capnography. So filter goes between the capnography and the bag, okay? Sweet. All right, so the next thing we're going to start talking about now is other things we can do. EMTs can now use BiPAP. All right, they change the protocols. It's under congestive heart failure. We'll talk about how to use it or not use it with the viral illnesses we've been seeing with COVID and with influenza. All right, and then there's some other drugs. Any drug that's been changed for the new updates at the EMT, the advanced or the paramedic level is listed under the formulary on ADPH website. There's really no big changes there, but if you want to look at the approved drugs, what you can, you can't give the routes and what are required and what are suggested is under formulary on their webpage, okay? Um, but for congestive heart failure, you can move forward if you want to, sir. Oh, I got the control now. I got power. This is great. I like that much better. Sweet. So CPAP, EMTs could use CPAP up to a couple of years ago. Uh, we can now do BiPAP. What's the difference between CPAP and BiPAP? Anybody in here know? Anybody care? Letters. Letters, very good, great. That's the EMS officer right there. I like that. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. One, so CPAP is continuous, right? It's continuous positive airway pressure. So basically, if these are the lungs, and y'all know I can't drive, drive, I mean draw. There's the heart, those are the lungs. That doesn't look good at all. All right, anyway, 
<laughs> you got positive airway pressure. What it does is it opens up and inflates the air sacs in the lungs, right? So that way they can exchange air, uh, uh, air uh, blow off CO2, and you improve oxygenation by that. You recruit air sacs or alveoli, as they say, right? Um, that's what CPAP is. It's one number. It could be 10 centimeters. It could be 12. It could be 15, right? Be whatever you got, right? BiPAP is different. BiPAP is CPAP with a bonus. So BiPAP, you got two numbers. So you got an inspiratory pressure and then a, uh, an exhalation pressure. So if I put it on 20 over 10, okay, that means at all times my patient has got CPAP at 10, just like we've been doing for years. Now, when they take a breath, the ventilator triggers and doubles the amount of pressure. So it helps them inhale. So this is really good to ventilate and oxygenation. So CPAP, the bottom number, increases oxygen, okay? The top number helps push more air in so they can blow more out and increases ventilation. So that would decrease the entitled CO2. So this is great for people who have COPD and retain CO2 because their lungs are hard and they can't ventilate well. This is great for those people, okay? This is also great for our congestive heart failure patients like we've talked about in the past because you increase the oxygenation and you also do what to the blood pressure here? Lowers the blood pressure, right, perfect. So CPAP, BiPAP saves lives. So we've talked about in the past for flash pulmonary edema, the patient that comes in, respiratory arrest, they're gurgling, you lay them flat, they start turning blue, you sit them up. We talked about the mnemonic we like to use, or I like, I only really like two mnemonics, the ABCs and then LMNOP. And P is for position. We set the patient straight up so they can aerate the tops of the lungs. And then we do positive pressure ventilation, either CPAP or BiPAP. And this actually saves lives, right? Pressure increases oxygenation, improves ventilation. Uh, what are the risks of using BiPAP? Same as CPAP, right? Yeah. So if they're nauseous and vomiting, I probably want to put a mask over and force that vomit back down their mouth hole, right? Okay. If they're already hypotensive and you know you're going to drop the pressure, you don't give it to them. All right. But BiPAP is pretty nice. The problem with BiPAP is it cost because you've got to have a ventilator to do it efficiently. So if you're working with an agency that has vents, which we're all going to get at some point in the next five to 10 years, um, you can use BiPAP now at the EMT level. Questions within reason from internet land or from here about BiPAP? Yes. Um, so if they are hypotensive, we can like do shock protocol because we don't give them fluids. Like dopamine, we only carry dopamine for like basic industry. Perfect. Yeah. Right. No, so those people are sick as dirt. So if you got a patient that said dialysis patient who was hypoxic, they're gurgling, you know they have flash pulmonary edema. You sit them up and you fix and start your BiPAP or your CPAP, and the blood pressure is 80. You're kind of hosed at that point. Right. Right. So yes, I agree. I will not give them fluid. They're volume overloaded. I will start dopamine. In reality, if you carry dobutamine, that's probably better. Right. Uh, but if you have dopamine, dopamine is you got to get the blood pressure up a little bit so you can do this positive pressure ventilation to fix the respiratory problems. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And that person probably going to end up on the vent pretty quick. They're sick, super sick. So in CPAP, you know, we make a distinction between ventilation and oxygenation. Yes. And CPAP falls under oxygenation. And so is that true for BIP? PAP as well. Obviously, we wouldn't use BiPAP on somebody who didn't have a respiratory drive, right? We would still need to ventilate them. Correct. Yes, they need to be breathing, right? Yeah. Now, you can set a rate on your BiPAP. So, if I got a dude in the hospital that is uh, congestive heart failure, pulmonary edema, and he's breathing 20 times a minute, I can put him on BiPAP and set it at a rate so that it triggers at 20 or 24 or 26 times a minute. And that usually kind of syncs up with the patient because they realize, Oh, it's breathing at that rate. If I breathe when the machine goes off, I breathe better. But if they don't have any respiratory effort, if they're breathing four or six times a minute, if they're altered, and I put a rate of 24, they're not going to get anything. They're going to get their breasts and then get extra shoved shove in their mouth for the other 20 beats of breasts. So that's the patient that's been a bag about mask or an automatic ventilator. Correct. So if they're altered, unresponsive, you're not doing BiPAP or CPAP. They're doing a BBM, right? And now we cheat. Instead of doing an OPA and bagging them, we put a, put a blind insertion device in them. It's like cheating. Cool. Uh, so this is uh, talking about BiPAP again, the protocols. They put that in there. 
remember the contraindications to BiPAP are the same as CPAP. Talking about uh, CPAP, BiPAP, bagging somebody during the era of, era of COVID. We obviously know that is a dangerous procedure for us. So if you're going to do that, you need goggles, face shield, N95, and you either need to have some kind of impermeable gown on, or when you get through taking care of the patient, change your clothes, take a quick shower, okay? That does not mean we don't do this. I've had people who have been missing dialysis because they were afraid to go get dialysis because of COVID. So they show up to the ER six days out and they are volume overloaded, okay? And had we not BiPAP them, they probably would have got intubated and gone to the ICU and spent days or weeks and probably caught COVID there. But these folks, we could BiPAP, get them better, lower their blood pressure, and get them to dialysis and they can go back home. So if a patient needs the intervention, we do it, right? We just take precautions, keep ourselves safe. This is just talking about where the protocols are. Let's go on that. So they added the distal femur site for peds. And the rationale for this is that um, smaller kids, less than two, sometimes if you're drilling, you can break the tibia. It happens. It doesn't mean you did anything wrong. It just, it's a small bone. Uh, the femur is a little bit stronger. I like the femur anyway. It's easier to get, okay? Uh, we would practice this uh, procedure in cadaver lab in September. Obviously, I won't have pediatric donors there, uh, but it's relatively the same type of procedure. Um, confirming placement of an IO, what do we look for? How do you know if the IO is working and in the right place? What do you look for? Good. It flows good, right? So it's got to flow. If you push fluid into it and the leg swells up, wrong hole, not working, right? All right, what else do you look for? Sometimes you see bone marrow come back, aspirate. If you don't, not a super big deal. Uh, flush, make sure it doesn't swell. And then what's the other big thing that I think about? Nobody been to my lab? Nobody cares? Not wobbly. Not wobbly. Very good. So the needle should be in there and not move, okay? You shouldn't have to secure these things. It's in a bone, okay? So, uh, so it should be uh, non-mobile. And then when you flush with fluid, it should not swell up the soft tissue around it. Okay, that's how you know you're in the right place. Wonderful. Um, what if they have a broken femur? Can you use the IO in the femur? No, very good answer, right, yeah. If there's a broken bone, you cannot use it on that, on that side. Very good. Hey, back on that, back on that last one, Doug. Yes, sir. Uh, it might be worth mentioning that the sternum is an approved site for adult IOs, but you can't use Every oh, device. It's yeah. got to be a device yeah. specific so, for sternal IO. So that'd be, right. So that'd be, yeah. Very good point. Um, some places, the military uses a sternal. Uh, no one in the Brims region should do a sternal IO. Okay. If you're working in an agency where you have one, you've been trained. If you're watching somewhere from a military installation, that's fine. No one in the Brims region should be doing a sternal IO. Nobody has that equipment. If you do, please send me an email. OK, so I can come look at it. All right. So, yes, the uh, IOs that we have are for the tibia, the humerus, the femur in kids, OK, or the tibia and the humerus in adults. Me in the ER, if I got a patient that's an adult, I'm using the distal femur, too. I like it. It's not approved for you guys yet, but I do it all the time. It works great. But no sternal IOs. OK, it's poor form to kill your patient. All right, so biads are approved for peds. They remove the use not indicated. Most kids are pretty easy to ventilate with a, a OPA and a back valve mask, but the eye gels make this even easier, okay? If you're gonna use an OPA and a BVM, medics, you have access to OG tubes, they get an OG tube, okay? The way you measure that is you measure from their, I can't draw, so you measure from the nose to the ear, to the sternum, and that's how deep you go, okay? And the OG tubes, the smaller ones, the 10, that's fine. I've used even 16 or 18 gauge OG tubes in kids. Uh, I measure the same way, it's a bigger tube, I get chunks of food out with them. The key is you wanna make sure it's the appropriate depth. Again, don't be doing this unless you've practiced some. So if you need help with these things, reach out to us. We'll come to the station, we'll help you practice with some of these things. 
All right, so hemodialysis, there's uh, in the protocols, I recommend looking through those. There's also pages here. There are a lot of people that are using hemodialysis at home now. And you show up on scene, they're sick, they're short of breath, they're altered, and you got to take them to the hospital, and they're hooked up, so what do you do? So common sense things. One, look for the shutoff valve on the machine. There should be an off and a on, okay? I'll probably take your cell phone out, snap a quick picture. Now, don't not do CPR or manage your patient's airway, right? Make your partner do that. These numbers are important to us. It tells us how much fluid they may have gotten off, what they didn't get done. The renal guys get a lot of data from that. So somebody snaps a quick picture of this screen, then you turn it off, all right? Then you're going to have to disconnect the patient from the machine itself. The way this thing works, and we've talked about it when we've done our renal studies, we'll do another one here in a couple of weeks with Dr. Rose. She's coming out. Uh, basically, they have an access graph, either or something plast uh, artificial or it's a fistula that the surgeons have created for them, and it's a big vessel right there. So they got a big needle in there, and you got two tubes coming out. So they can pull blood out and then push the blood back in and clean the, filter the blood way out here. If they're still hooked up to the machine, what you're going to have to do is clamp this off. Most of them have clamps, almost like a roller clamp that you have in your IV tubing, but sometimes they're a push clamp. So you push those short, uh, uh, shut, all right? And then at that point, you can unscrew this. If they have caps available, you can put the caps on there. If they don't have caps, get you a saline syringe and hook that up there, all right? Just so it's not flopping free, all right? What you don't really wanna do is undo this because that's gonna bleed like a bear for a little while, okay? If this does happen to come off and they start bleeding, what do you do? Direct pressure, yeah. Remember, when they do dialysis at home, big bolus of heparin, and that is a blood thinner. It jacks up platelets, so they're going to be very prone to bleeding. So if this comes loose, they're going to bleed like a bear. Direct pressure, okay? What you want to do. You don't do a pressure dressing, but direct pressure. If you have a little bit of combat gauze, you can put some of that on there. It's not going to hurt them. Um, well, we won't talk about TXA there yet. But uh, you want to control the bleeding, okay? If... You look under this and this thing has been cut and ruptured and it's squirting blood out. What do you do different? Tourniquet. Yeah, not over the fistula, high and tight, okay? And you put it on there until the bleeding stops, all right? If it doesn't hurt, it's not on tight enough, right? But remember, this is a big freaking vessel. People can die from that. If it's bleeding from where the IV, the, the access comes out, direct pressure is fine. If that thing ruptures, you gotta get a tourniquet. I'll show you some cool pictures in a couple of weeks. Questions about that within reason? Take that as a no. There are just different ways to disconnect different devices. Just look at it, remember common sense. There's a needle stuck in the arm, sometimes two. You gotta get that out. You don't wanna pull it out at this point in the game. Clamp it, caps or a syringe and tape it down so it doesn't flop, okay? Would not use this for IV access. I would not use it to give fluids to somebody, to give them medications. That's probably not a wise thing to do. I'm sorry, if you you're, pop no. a dove and you're leaving the disconnect it, yep. um, do you flush it or do you leave it the Just blood leave it. in the tube? Leave the blood in the tube, I would not flush it, okay. yeah. So if that blood clots off, it doesn't matter because when you get to the hospital, we're going to disconnect that, right? And I think the rationale for this protocol is so that you guys don't pull this out and inadvertently rupture that, okay? Because then it's really bad because now you got to put a tourniquet and get to the hospital. If these rupture, you want them in the OR quickly. So it's better if we mess it up in the ER than you mess it up, okay? Like just the saline lock on the end if they yeah. don't have the cap? Yeah, that's perfect. Saline locks. Yeah, even better than a syringe. Yes, sir. Yeah. Like what you put on the end of your uh, IV when you start with free hang fluids. Perfect. Yep. So we've got a couple questions from the internet, Doc. Yes, sir. Um, pediatric biads and all other OG tubes, are they on the required equipment list now? And yep. does it matter for transport versus non-transport? They are on the required equipment list as of June 14th. Yes, sir. Now, I'm sure I can't speak for the state, but I doubt you're going to get inspected on the 15th. If you don't have them, you can get in trouble. But they are going to be on the required list. I know the buy ads, I think the OGs. Okay. The comment was that they're not, as of two days ago, the list wasn't updated yet. Yeah. They weren't on there. So I would look. There were some changes made last night that I saw. 
So look again, but I was told there would be only required this. State doesn't care which type of blind insertion device you get. It can be an eye gel, it can be a king, like I said, anything, okay? But I recommend whatever you get, you practice with it, you know how to use it. Find your offline medical director, your training officer, you got to practice. You can't just put them on the truck and expect an EMT that's been an EMT for 15 years to know how to work with one because they have not been allowed to do it until next week. Sweet. All right, so chest decompression uh, has been added back and they added the site. So this is the protocol where they put it in there for pneumothorax. It says consider chest decompression if signs of attention. So to review, a pneumothorax, is you get air between the lung and the chest wall. So this will be a closed pneumothorax. Dude gets hit with the baseball bat, cracks a rib. That rib scratches the lung, all right, the pleura. You get a tear in those air sacs. So when dude breathes in, air comes out and fills this space, lung collapses. What kind of signs and symptoms should that person have? Dyspnea, yeah, they should hurt. Dude got hit with a baseball bat. You should feel some, maybe some crepitus. A lot of times this air leaks into the subcutaneous tissue and you can feel that, all right? They should be short of breath, they may be hypoxic, they should be breathing fast, right? When you listen to them, it's probably diminished, all right? but they should not be altered or hypotensive from this, right? This is an open pneumothorax. This is a dude that gets stabbed. Knife goes in, pokes a hole, knife comes out. Air's leaking out just like last time. And now you got a open wound. Similar symptoms, right? How do you treat that? Yeah, put an occlusive dressing over it, all right? Tape down three sides so you want air to be able to come out but not go back in. All right, but dude should still be awake, alert, talking to you, not hypotensive, right? Attention pneumothorax is when you have a pneumothorax, and you can diagnose that in the field, right? He's gonna be probably dysmic, maybe hypoxic, but he's gonna have signs of a reason to have a pneumothorax. Usually it's trauma. Tension is when you get so much air in this chest cavity that it pushes this lung over, it shifts the mediastinum, pushes the heart over, and because blood supply to the heart is passive, right? It's coming up the venous system, and you got so much pressure in here, it lowers the blood pressure, just like CPAP or BiPAP does. Except there's so much pressure, it stops blood flow. So now dude is really hypotensive, blood pressure 80, 90, he's tachycardic, he is altered, okay? Or it completely stops the blood flow, and now dude is breading down and has no pulse, going into cardiac arrest. That is a tension pneumothorax, okay? So for, to have a tension pneumothorax, you first gotta have a pneumothorax and then signs of tension. And tension is either um, altered mental status, poor perfusion is defined by low blood pressure and probably tachycardia, or it's defined as cardiac arrest, okay? So the state doesn't give us a number. There's no VP's gotta be 90, heart rate's gotta be 150. None of that stuff's there anymore, which is fantastic, which means you don't have to sit there and cycle the blood pressure, all right, and try to get one before you decompress somebody that's got attention pneumothorax. But it also means you got to be accountable and know what attention pneumothorax is and not be sticking needles in people that have just a regular pneumothorax, okay? Hey, Doug, first. <laughs> yes, sir. So would you be comfortable with signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax? Indications of a pneumothorax. Yep. A person um, who, so we see a we see a negative change in mental status. Assume that it's gone to attention, or we had a patient who had a, a peripheral pulse, like a real pulse, and now we can't feel it anymore. Would you take either one of those yes. as a good indication of tension pneumothorax? Yes. So you guys know how to recognize somebody that's sick as dirt. That's the key. This patient is sick. If they're asking for a black and mild, if they want a cigarette. You know, if they're on their cell phone playing Panda Pop, or whatever that game is, they don't have a tension pneumothorax. They have a pneumothorax and they're sick as dirt. It's a tension, right? Make sense? All right. So GSW the chest, he's talking to you. You got your IVs in, you head into the hospital. You look at the monitor, his heart rate is 140, 130, 110, 90. He is now not breathing. You're gonna start bagging the sky. I'm gonna pop a needle on both sides of his chest. 
bag him and open up some fluids. Okay, because if he has a tension pneumothorax, I just fixed it. I may have bought him another five or 10 minutes to get to the hospital to get blood from us or get an intervention. If he doesn't have a pneumothorax, he's already dying. Okay, all right. The key is you got to be able to defend to say it was a tension. Okay, the other thing you think about is locations. Do I have a picture here? So classically, we talk about the third intercostal space, mid axial, oh, sorry, mid convicular line. So that's the clavicle. That's the nipple, that's the sternum. So he'll get a chest right here, right? That's where you decompress. State says now you can do fourth intercostal space on the mid axillary line. So that's his shoulder. This is his axilla. We call this kind of like a triangle of safety when we put our chest tubes in. Anything below the anatomical nipple line theoretically can be in the belly. You don't want to decompress the chest and hit the stomach. That's not good, it doesn't do anything. All right, you will get in trouble, the patient doesn't get better. So you wanna be above the anatomical nipple line, okay, in the fourth intercostal space. I usually think the first rib's about the clavicle. Some folks I can't feel, so I say one, maybe two, maybe three, maybe four. And the needle goes right there. You wanna to try to go above the rib if you can, because the vein, the artery, the nerve runs um, below that. Uh, but in reality, some of the people who take care of are really big, it's hard to feel. So what I do is I put my thumb in there, I find the appropriate location, I put the needle in, if I hit a bone, I back out and angle it up, all right? If you're doing a chest decompression with a needle or a, a big angiopath, you don't need a flutter valve. You don't need to cut a finger off of the glove, stick it on there, uh, enough air is not gonna go in there to cause a problem. You decompress the chest and you get back hands on the patient. Do they get better? Do they not get better? And if they didn't, why is the case? Maybe it wasn't attention pneumo, maybe they're dying because of blood loss, maybe we gotta do something different, okay? And again, if you haven't done this on real people, it's time to come practice in the lab in September. And even if you did, we need to practice. Updates, there's a tactical paramedic protocol now, you have to take the exam and be certified. The gist of that uh, protocol is everything is cat A when you're working in a tactical environment and you can do surgical airways. Obviously, if you have not done a surgical airway, you need to practice and train before you do it on people. We can do that in cadaver lab. All right. Talked about those. Wording we're not going to talk about. Some forms they removed, so there's no more needle decompression forms. But in the Brims region, if you're decompressing the chest, we would know about it. As long as you can prove that they had tension, I got your back. You're supposed to do that, okay? Um, but you got to be able to say they were in, uh, had a tension pneumothorax. Critical care section has its own protocols now, not super scary. So cool things we got now. So TXA, TXA has changed. It has been category B and it was one gram over 10 minutes. It is now cat A and it's two grams, okay? Uh, you want to give it no faster than 100 milligrams per minute or you get some low blood pressure, all right? TXA comes pre-made in 100 mil bags, or it comes in a vial. Either way, if you're given two grams, you need at least 200 cc's. <clears throat> Basically what TXA does, is if you think about blood clots, if this is a blood clot, red cells, these are the strands that hold the clot together. When you have a blood clot, the body goes and it breaks this clot down and remakes it. So it's always kind of make things better. It's like remodeling your kitchen over and over and over again, right? What TXA does is TXA makes it where you can't break this down. So that clot never gets weaker, okay? So the problem in trauma when we talk about permissive hypotension and we don't wanna give a lot of crystalloids to people is as the body breaks this stuff down and we give them fluids, these clotting factors get diluted out and wash away from the original clot. So when it's trying to remodel, it loses stability. They bleed more from that initial wound. TXA fixes that. There are limited risks to TXA. One risk, hypotension, if you give it too fast. That is a relative risk, okay? TXA is a great drug. It's an optional drug in the state, but I'm telling you, if you're a program that does not carry blood products, it is well worth it. It will save lives, personal opinion. Official program here, I've been reviewing it. It's brand new, came out last week. But the indications are, 
uh, traumatic hemorrhagic shock, TXA is the way to go. All right. And we'll talk about this more and more as we go along. The TXA has got a lot of good uses and other things. Those can all be kept B and call in for, but that's not for today. The other thing I want to mention, we've talked in the past about was one milligram. So, you know, my thoughts on this, I look at all EKGs, the too fast, too slow, or okay-ish, right? So this one, too slow, not even close to being okay. It's like, why are you doing a public diet? It's like CPR. The reason for to be, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to treat the patient to bradycardic. So this guy, he gets atropine, one milligram. As he's doing that, I'm hanging my fluid. I'm hanging my dopamine. We talked about how we titrate that. My partner, I'm calling the doc saying, hey, guy that's got a heart rate of, like he's having a big stimmy. He's not responding to atropine or dopamine. I need to order for calcium in the pace. I'll be there in a few minutes. All right. And unfortunately, pacing in Alabama still be as well. All right, but we did get our atropine dose changed. Uh, it was a atropine dose changed in uh, AHA as well, or is that? Uh, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. No, it has not changed in American Heart Association. Okay. My thoughts on that one milligram is if I'm giving somebody half a milligram of atropine, if they don't get better, I'm going to have to give them a one milligram. Okay. If I give them one milligram and they don't get better, you know, I'm not going to give another dose. One's going to fix you or at least make you better. And if it doesn't, two's not going to help. Okay. Plus, sometimes you got to have your glasses on and the flashlight to figure out what 0.5 is. All right. Ketamine, I got about five minutes. Ketamine, nothing changed with ketamine, uh, but we just got to talk about it again. Every time we talk about protocols, ketamine is a great drug for excited delirium. It's a great drug for respiratory issues like asthma, if you're uh, an expanded practice paramedic. Uh, but there are some concerns with it. Ketamine is a, a social dis, uh, dissociative drug. A lot of good things for it. A lot of bad things that come out of it as well. All right. The biggest thing is respiratory depression. So if I got a five foot six inch male who's fighting the cops and they finally got him slowed down enough that we can give him medication to sedate him. He's five foot six inches. He's 300 pounds. <laughs> right. He's kind of healthy. How much ketamine does he get? For excited delirium, one million milligrams. No, five hundred. No. Right. So everybody's saying five hundred, right? Because it comes five hundred milligrams. In what five cc's? Is that what you're getting, or is it ten cc's? Ten, ten, ten cc's. cc's. All right, I'll take that. So, dude, is jaw freaking enormous, right? So the dose per state is four mg per kilo. I would say that's a relatively okay dose. I'm more of a two mg kind of guy, but four mg is reasonable. Some places use it. All right. All right, but the problem here is ketamine's got to be dosed on ideal body weight, not actual body weight. So what does that mean? That means it's really based off height, not weight. So these two guys, about the same height, they will get the same dose of ketamine. These guys, he gets a bigger dose than he does, even if they weigh the same. All right, because he's taller. Now we never talked about this much in paramedic school. There are a lot of formulas out here. A lot of these are from years ago. All right. What I do is I kind of use my formula. And I say that I do 52 kilograms at five foot. I would say and then two kilograms per inch in males and females. So Big difference, right? So five foot six is 52. Six times two is 12. 52 and 12 is 64, right? So dude should really get 256 milligrams. And everybody in the room said give me 500. All right? His actual dose would have been 640. There's no reason to open up two vials of ketamine for anybody. If you're doing that, something is wrong. All right? But he should get about 256 milligrams. All right? That's the dose he needs. All right, so you give that dose to me, what do you do? If it becomes hypoxic, if he uh, becomes altered, at that point, we do not give him an O2, right? Because it's not an oxygen problem, it's a ventilation problem. This guy gets jaw thrust, maybe a nasal trumpet, 
If it gets better, you high five your partner. Everything is great. If he doesn't, then he gets an OPA and gets bags of BBM, and then you can apply oxygen. Anybody gets ketamine, once they chillax, they're a critical patient. You expose them, you get them naked, you cut their clothes off, you look for patches, for holes, look for things that kill people. If you have capnography, which everybody should have now, even at the EMT level, capnography goes on them. You watch your weight for them, all right? If you see an entitled CO2 of 60, and you get a respiratory rate of four, and their stats are low, and you put on a non-rebreather, their stats will go up, but their entitled CO2 will continue to climb. And eventually they become so hypercapnic, they go into cardiac arrest. So you got to address post-ketamine hypoxia or hypercapnia with ventilation, not just oxygen. Otherwise, people die. So key things on ketamine. Figure out your height so you know what dose of ketamine you would get. All right? And that way you can kind of look at all your patients, figure out their dose. It should be more height-based than weight-based. All right? When in doubt, go a little bit lower. You can always give a little bit more. You can't take any more out. Never give anybody more than one vial of ketamine. I would say never give anybody more than 400 ketamine ever. Okay. And unless you're expanding the scope and you're fixing to intubate them. But if you do give them ketamine, expose them, make sure you don't miss anything. You cannot treat hypoxia with oxygen. You treat it with airway management or your patient can die. And that's poor form. All right, guys, go to our webpage. The other videos are on here. If you want help with your protocol training, that is fine. If you're in the brim region, reach out. I'm happy to come out there. You got to practice with your new airway management for uh, EMTs, the IGLs, Kings, whatever you got. We can talk about Axpain, talk about TXA. All right. If you don't have an active medical director, now is the time. If you're a transporting agency, all right, reach out to somebody. You may have to invest a little bit of money in that. But that's very reasonable with the things that we're doing now. If you're non transport and you want help, I'm your guy. Reach out to me. If you don't like me, you want to offend me, I'll find somebody for you. But you got to have help. Okay? Questions, comments, statements before we take a break. Uh, let's see, online, <clears throat> we don't have any new questions. You covered the atropine issue. There were some questions about that. So, once again, the atropine does change from 0.5 to 1 milligrams. Right. Uh, the other big changes, just to summarize, Blind insertion devices uh, all the way down to EMT scope of practice. Correct. And blind insertion devices added for pediatric patients. Correct. Distal femur side for IO added for pediatric patients under two years old. Correct. And what else? OG tubes and then OG TXA. And TXA. Right. right. Yep. So we're going to do protocols again uh, a little bit on the 17th and at the end of June. There'll be no videos, but we'll do those again. And again, I can't stress enough, some of this new stuff, the blind assertion devices, the TXA, the ketamine, if you need help with that, reach out to somebody, okay? All right. Hey, everybody, we're going to take a break. Just to remind everyone, you can get your, uh, you can get your certificate by emailing Alabama EMS Challenge at gmail.com. When we come back, we'll have Dr. Evans lecturing on exposed head injury. So we'll get about five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Test. Everybody, welcome back. Um, we're going to have Dr. Evans now talk to us a little bit about closed head, head injury. Dr. Evans. Hey, guys. So kind of a topic that a lot of us see every day, um, closed head injury, and then we'll also go over some spinal cord trauma. Again, for those of you who had not seen when I've lectured, I'm one of the attendings over at UAB ER. Um, and then I'm just kind of get into it. So this is, again, this will be closed head injuries and spinal cord trauma. Good. I don't like sitting still, so I'll kind of stay somewhere right in here. So closed head injuries, just some, uh, some definition and some kind of just background about them and why we're talking about them. The term closed head injury really means it's a traumatic blunt force injury to the head, no penetrating trauma, 
Um, the dura matter usually remains intact. And then of course there's no cranial penetration. You can have underlying fractures. That becomes a whole different thing. Um, it estimates in the U.S. to affect anywhere from 550 to 600,000 a year. Some of the last estimates were about 570,000 patients a year. They're the leading cause of death, traumatic injuries as a whole, leading cause of death in children, teens, young adults. But traumatic head injuries um, actually cause immediate death in approximately 25% of those cases. No, no, no. We'll be sorry. I was making sure they got to hear the, the page up. <clears throat> um, so when we're talking about close-hit injuries, obviously MVCs being the number one cause of these, especially in young adults and teens. Um, alcohol and drug use contributes to about 38% of the closed-head head injury cases, and you can kind of see how that would happen. You're high, you're drunk, you're going to fall, you're going to stumble, hit your head. Um, we, didn't, we haven't talked much about older people. They do fall a little bit more often. They have more gait instability just as a, a whole in the population. But what complicates them is quite a number of the elderly, and at these times also some 30s and 40-year-old folks, um, do use anticoagulants due to various things, where they've had heart disease in the past, they've had strokes, they've had um, pulmonary embolus or leg clots, DVTs. So that's something to kind of keep in the back of your mind when you do go to a... a uh, head injury seen, even if it's a traumatic head injury from an NBC. That's one big question to ask really anybody these days. One of the big reasons we talk about this is not just that it affects the majority of society, it's when you have these, they're actually pretty devastating. So they range from mild, moderate to severe, and we could go into the classification systems, we could go into how you do all that. But it matters because when you have a mild head injury, these are things like concussions, contusions, maybe even a real tiny, tiny bleed. Those are usually, almost none of those folks die. Very, very rarely. But when you get to moderate, they've got a little more de um, neurological devastation, about 7% of those die. When you've got a severe traumatic brain injury, then you look at 36 to 50% of those folks, no matter what you do, are gonna pass away. Um, so it's really important for us to know what we're dealing with, treat them as best we can to prevent from Maybe they're in the moderate section, but if we don't do things right, it's going to have more severe consequences down the road. That's why it becomes more of an issue. Um, the other thing is those that do survive actually are left with pretty devastating neurological effects. And you've got patients, I'm sure that y'all transport on a regular basis, that have had spinal cord injuries, they've had um, bad head injuries, and essentially they're either in a vegetative state or they can't care for themselves at all. Um, they require a large amount of care which also comes back to just medical care dollars. In this day and age, everything comes back to the dollar, right? And closed head injuries, spinal cord injuries, on average cost about $100 billion a year to take care of. They're not, I mean, we have a lot of patients that do that, but as a total in our society, that's a small piece of the pie. Um, but that small population accounts for $100 billion of health care costs. So we'll kind of go into, and this will be my only controversial topic today, I promise. So, um, but we'll kind of go into the levels of traumatic brain injuries, and they range from very mild, such as concussion, and I have to bring out Sean Shivers here. Um, but a concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury that may or may not be associated with loss of consciousness. And the reason I put this was not just to kind of tout Auburn, Alabama, or anything like that, even though Auburn is kind of supreme right now. Uh, um, yeah, I just lost about everybody on here, but, <laughs> but in all honesty, so football injuries, this is where most everybody thinks of concussions, right? Sports related injuries. They can happen from simply falling down outside from an MBC. You'll have a large amount of people that come to the emergency department. They say, well, I hit my head on my steering wheel or the airbag popped me. Okay. Would you get knocked out for a second? How many of them say, yeah, yeah, for a second. Really, they just got dazed. But when they ask me, hey, did I have a concussion? The answer is usually, probably. It all depends on, did you have an altered mental state, altered mental status at any point? 
it could simply be that you got knocked for a loop. I know me personally and a lot of the guys in here that have played football, you've had this hit before and you kind of stumbled around for a second, didn't know where you were. 20 minutes later, back when I played, you were back in the game. Now you're under concussion protocol and all that. But you truly had a concussion. It's the same thing with NBCs and, and falls. Very mild concussions can have long-term effects. And I'm saying that by concussions are a mild injury. They're basically a mild bruise to the brain, a shock to the brain. But you can have sequela for minutes, hours, days, weeks after the event, such as headaches, blurred vision, nausea, vomiting. And that's called post-concussive syndrome that a lot of people do deal with. And that's why we've moved in sports to concussion protocol. We're preventing downstream effects. We're preventing downstream brain injury if we can, affect, if we can help them out in the short term. So same with if you go to an accident and they said, I had a loss of consciousness, I truly had what sounds like a concussion, they don't necessarily have to go to the hospital. We need to talk a little further about what happened. But you may want to tell them like, hey, nobody can say you don't have a concussion. Here are things to look out for. If you start having bad blurred vision, gait instability, nausea, vomiting, it won't stop. You get your tail to the hospital as fast as you can. Because then you worry about, has it developed a bleed? Okay. Hey, Dr. Evans, before, yes. before we get off that subject, so one thing that's, that's been confusing for a long time is most of the EMS textbooks define concussion as a mechanism of an injury or a blow to the head with no structural brain damage that's evident. So it's kind of the best case scenario for sure. head trauma. Sure. Uh, so really anybody that hits their head by that definition has a concussion, mm -hmm. but we just don't treat it. So we treat it or we we want to follow up those patients if they're symptomatic. Is that fair to say? That's very fair to say. That's perfect. That's perfect. Um, asymptomatic people, you really don't have to do too much. Just give them the precautions. Um, same thing I would do if they came to the ER and say, hey, here are your return precautions. Here's why to call EMS, but you're exactly right. Symptomatic patients are more concerning. So you also have the next level, right? You have a contusion. This is actually a structural bruise on the brain. May or may not be associated, associated with a large volume of bleeding, but when you talk about contusions, these are more than just I got knocked silly for a second. These are actually the coup contra crew injuries that we talk about when you are in an NBC. Maybe it's a motorcycle crash where they're wearing their helmet, but your brain is floating in a big sea of jelly. And so that head's going to stop. The cranium may or may not absorb the forces, but that brain's going to continue to travel forward. And it's going to impact the, the uh, front of the frontal bone here and cause a frontal injury. But just as, just like you would see something sloshing around in a bathtub, your brain's doing that inside your cranium. And it's going to go backwards and cause a contra coup injury. And surprisingly enough, we're going to see a, a pretty good number of, hey, I had a frontal head injury, but it's the contra coup where I'm going to see a lot of the other impact and the bleeding maybe. Um, so just because they hit the front of their head, if they say, oh, it really hurts back here, which is kind of weird, that's a little concerning for us. So again, contusion is both related to the direct impact as well as the rebound forces coming off the contra coup side. <clears throat> You're going to see them most often when you have direct impacts either to the front or they fall backwards under their head. Um, not a lot to say about this other than the forces when you get to the contusion level. Again, it's another level. You got concussion, you got contusion or bruise. It's just more force. So you got to suspect there may be a fraction underneath as well. That's why you don't let Pell City guys play with technology. All right. And then next, basically what we're doing, guys, we're just going through here are the levels of brain injury. And then we'll kind of talk about some management stuff here in a little bit. So we've gone from concussion, not so bad, contusion, bruise on the brain. So now we've actually done some big structural damage to the vasculature and we've ruptured for an epidural hematoma, which is this right here, this white. So to kind of back up, CT's tissue is kind of grayish. Fluid is black. And then anything white is either bone or blood. Okay. So 
Epidural hematomas, these are frequently caused from an impact to the side of the head. You have a middle meningeal artery which lives right here in the temporal bones. So they'll fracture their temporal bone, it'll lacerate the middle meningeal artery, and it'll start bleeding usually into these spaces here. So somewhere right in here, and you see the bleed happening right here. It's probably lacerated somewhere in this general region. Okay. So epidural hematomas, one thing that's kind of interesting about these is you have a lucid interval with these. And what that means is this person has fallen, they've hit their head, maybe knocked them for a loop for a second. They say, man, I'm fine. You, you see the crash. You see that it's probably a high mechanism. They obviously hit their head pretty hard. They said, man, I'm fine. Well, you go back to their home six hours later, and now family says, I don't know what happened. They fell out. Now they're comatose lying in the floor. That would make me highly concerned for an epidural hematoma. And the reason for that is because you've lacerated an artery, it's not going to immediately fill up with blood. There's space in there for things to kind of compress, okay? But it's going to develop so quickly that at some point, this is going to impact their level of consciousness because of swelling, because of pressure. And that's when they'll go down. So when you talk about a lucid interval, that makes you think of epidural hematomas. It's really the main one that does a true lucid interval. Bad head injury, huge blow to the head, and then they're unconscious hours later or even 30 minutes later, just it varies. On average, it's anywhere from two to six hours. But it can happen longer, it can happen shorter, okay? And then for me, when I'm doing CTs, it has a very distinct shape. It looks like a lens, like a contact lens or a crescent shape here. It's about the only type of bleed that looks like that. Okay. There we go. And that as opposed to a subdural. We've, we've all heard of epidural versus subdural. Most of the time you're going to hear about subdurals. The reason being these are actually, on average, a little more common. And what you've done is you've had such a strong head injury that you've got little bridging veins that run between the covering of the brain, the arachnoid matter, the dura matter. And what happens is those little brains that are between these two levels, as you have the shear forces from the impact, will tear those veins and you'll bleed in between the two layers. There's three layers, but two of the layers covering the brain between that and the skull. And what happens is the same thing. You have blood filling basically a balloon that has nowhere to go, and it starts compressing the brain and causing a lot of issues there. So again, this is the most common lesion that you'll find with a traumatic brain injury. Um, it's You've ruptured the bridging veins between those things. And then this is where you don't necessarily have a lucid interval. And it's because it's a venous bleed but also because to do that bridging vein rupture, it's a serious head injury. There's going to be a lot of other injuries there. Um, but they generally don't feel great right after. They don't jump up and say, hey, I'm fantastic. I'm going to go run home. Okay. And then again from CTs, can you see the difference? This one, instead of it follows the cranial line. So if this is a cranial, it makes the curve. The epidural hematoma is very well defined and it pokes out from the curve of the cranium, okay? But it also, do y'all remember the sutures? Have y'all seen a skull and it has all the lines here? Epidural hematomas don't cross those lines usually. They are very well confined in one little area. But when you get to subdural hematomas, they cross those suture lines and they can cause a dramatic amount of, of bleeding all the way from the front to the back, and it can make all this brain tissue shift pretty heavily. Um, and you'll see kind of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about shifts here in a second. So let's start with a case. Y'all have heard me talk about a bunch of stuff for a little bit. Actual case I had <clears throat> in the emergency department, but this will kind of give what, it scared us in the emergency department because of what wound up happening. 62 year old guy, you go to MVC, Officers call you and say, hey, he hit a bunch of cars, came to rest on a tree, but man, he's drunk as a skunk. He admits to it. He says, yeah, I, I drank a lot today. 
He's a chronic drinker, drinks every single day. He's a known guy to the police officers, not necessarily to y'all, but they go to him all the time. He's drunk. He falls. He runs his cars and things. He's just a nuisance. Well, when you get to him, you don't really see any outward damage. The car's destroyed. The cars that he hit are absolutely demolished. So there's one thing to think about. But when you look at him, he looks great. He's walking around. Police are kind of chasing him. They don't want to handcuff him because he's, he's old. They don't know what's wrong with him. But he's absolutely belligerent, trying to fight you. There's no way he's going to let you touch him. He says, I'm fine. I just want to go to jail. I want to get this over with. I'm not going anywhere with you. But obviously intoxicated. So we'll stop right there. And again, this is not meant to be anything political. This is not meant to even say anything about police custody. This is to tell you, as EMS personnel, you're going to get these calls all the time. I got them all the time. Y'all still get them all the time. Hey, I need you to clear this guy before he goes to jail. I don't know what to do with him. And that's, that's reasonable. That's appropriate care from, from law enforcement. So anybody who wants to chime in, what do you do with this guy? The mechanism of injury is significant, so you should trauma alert him, I would assume. Yeah, that's not unreasonable at all. Not yeah, unreasonable at all. There's no way we could clear him in a pre hospital setting. Right. Correct. Correct. I mean, his vital signs are going to be up anyway just because he's belligerent. So, yeah. His vital signs aren't going to yeah. tell you much unless he's. He might have done cocaine right with his, with his fifth of liquor that he drank. And actually, this guy did a bunch of drugs too. But there's no telling what it's going to be like an hour. Exactly. Perfect point. Perfect point. So what happened with this guy? Everybody involved in, in the actual scene care did everything like they're supposed to. He's like, I can't clear you. you got to go to the emergency department. And even in the emergency department, he spent probably two hours with me, and we just fought and fought and fought. And I said, I really don't want to sedate this old guy. Because y'all have seen if we go to the trauma bay, if you're a turd, you're going to get sedated so we can do the care because we don't know what injuries you have. And he fit that protocol, but he, he, we didn't trauma alert him. Could have very easily trauma alerted this guy because of mechanism, right? We didn't. We put him in one of the pods. Finally, as we're trying to figure out things with him, I said, you know what? He's actually physically trying to walk out. He's going to strike a staff member here in a minute. Let's just sedate him and let's get the workup done. We get the workup done. This is his CT. As we talked about, this white area, that's blood. And so this, so just kind of give you a progression here. This is his initial CT. We said, oh, what if I let this guy go home? What if I let him go to jail? Oh, gosh. We got, we got kind of lucky. But initial CT, this is his progression. And this progression is over less than an hour. So once we, we don't know what the original bleed was because, again, we had fought with him for a while trying to figure out what to do, where was it going to be. Y'all have seen the boarding issues at UAB, so it just is what it is. But he progressed to this. Very, 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 very bad. So long story short, to kind of wrap it up, he was a guy, he was a drinker, he did cocaine, his vasculature is already bad because he's old, he drinks, and he does cocaine, which is really bad for the vessels, but also he's killed his liver. So now his clotting factors are shot. So now he's just going to bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed. Um, so neurosurgery got involved, it didn't end well for him, um, but again, that's a gentleman who looked fine was just a turd to everybody, and he very well could have been just a drunk butthole. But he wound up, but we, we did the things that we needed to do and found this. So we talk about it in the emergency department. It's the same way with y'all. You're kind of a, you're kind of wearing clown shoes in a minefield, right? We go to a lot of stuff that's not anything. You just get, you get cursed out. You deal with a lot of stuff. You're like, I'm, I'm done with that. But you never know, okay? So just kind of treat everybody the exact same way. If you think X person needs this, you probably do it for Y person as well. Okay. Is you ever authorized the use of TXA for a head injury? Yeah, so we did a study about that at UAB, and they tried it. They didn't show a tremendous amount of benefit from it, but I, I probably would. In that case right there, If let's just say another place that works Pell City. If I'm in Pell City, I'm not going to be drilling burr holes in people's heads, and I just got to do something to get them to a neurosurgeon? Yeah, probably. Yeah. TXA overall, you do have the clotting issues and you have things you got to consider, 
But in those cases, there may be a record and I can't do anything on it. Yeah. 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 Um, so what this guy had, he had an intraventricular and intraparenchymal hemorrhage, which is this IPH. Long word, just meant he bled apart. He is not supposed to bleed. Okay. This one slide is talking about both subarachnoid hemorrhages and an intraparenchymal hemorrhage. Subarachnoid, again, we've gone from epidural, which is the outer layer of the brain. You're bleeding outside of that between that layer and the cranium. Then we went to subdural. It's in the actual bag that covers the brain. And now we've gone to subarachnoid, which is right against the brain tissue. It's between the second layer of the bag and the brain tissue. All it means is once you get further and further and further in, it's harder for a surgeon to get to it, and it's harder to treat. You usually have worse outcomes, okay? Epidurals usually, you drill a hole, it evacuates, and you're probably going to be okay. But subarachnoids and intraparenchymal hemorrhages are very devastating. We actually call this, it's difficult to see, but can you see again these little white areas right here? Normal brain tissue is this gray. But these real high density white areas here, 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 and then here. So like a star, y'all. So we see that in the emergency department. That's, a, that's what we essentially call star of death. You have that. There's not a lot I can do for you because what you've done is you've bled so deeply into the base of the brain. A lot of times that happens with um, ruptured aneurysms, but you've bled so deeply into the base of the brain, it's very difficult for a neurosurgeon to access, and so they can't do a lot for you. And so you see these, any of these, that's very bad. It's usually going to be a pretty bad outcome for the patient most of the time. So to kind of go along with that, you have very high morbidity. So these are the neuro neurologically devastated people. But you also have high mortality with these injuries too. So rule of threes, right? A third of them are going to survive. A third of them are going to be, they're going to survive, but they are totally disabled. And then a third of them are going to die. No matter, and this is no matter what you do. Okay where you can bring them from this level to this level, or maybe even this level to this level, is just maximize the care in pre-hospital and the early settings, both in the emergency settings as well, okay? Um, and we'll kind of go over what that means. Then the last one I'm gonna talk about, and then we'll move on to management, which is more of what we care about, right? This is diffuse axonal injury. This is just overall bad. What's happened in these, you've got rotational acceleration forces. They hit their head, they hit, have an MVC, and it just shears all these axons, the, ner the nerves within the brain. They bleed, and you, you see the CT, and it's just a bunch of small punctate hemorrhages all over the place. When, you, when this happens, there's absolutely nothing you can do. They're going to be whatever they're going to be, whether that's alive or dead. But a lot of times that you find... People like this, when they do an autopsy on people who've had a traumatic brain injury or a bad MVC, 30 to 40 percent of the ones that have a TBI or die from a TBI is from this. It's just kind of their time to go. There's not anything anybody can do on this. So case number two, and this, this, this is where we start to get into some management. So you've got a 48-year-old guy, MCC, so he's a motorcycle crash. He's wearing a helmet. But you get there, patient's unresponsive. Helmet is lying away from him. So bystander says, hey, he hit this truck. He went over the handlebars. And when he went over the handlebars, the helmet went flying. So obviously he wasn't wearing a properly fitting helmet. So what well, he's wearing a helmet. So again, patient helmet off as soon as you get to him. He's unresponsive to verbal stimuli or painful stimuli. You don't see any outward injury other than you see some abrasions to the head. He's got sonorous respirations. They're four per minute. The cerebrate posturing. So remember, core to the body, that's corticate. Cerebrate is kind of extension. Um, again, no obvious deformities. You do a very quick assessment to make sure you're not seeing, missing a life-threatening bleed. And then these are your vital signs. So you got a blood pressure 205 over 113. Pulse is 48. Uh, O2 is 96%, but again, his breaths per minute are four. So let's just start kind of top to bottom. We've, we've done our primary assessment, right? What's his GCS? Because if y'all lived in the days of Melton, this was, oh, this was our number one thing she wanted to know. What's her GCS? 
Did we say he was unresponsive? He is. He has no response to painful or verbal stimuli. So his GCS is three. So he's a little higher than that, but very close. And the reason I'm saying that, he's got dyserapin. So, I mean, it's semantics, right? It's a three or a four. We're going to do the same thing. He was technically a four. So let's go back over this. And if you want to rem remember how these go, I usually start with motor. So you got a six cylinder motor. There are six parts to your, your motor response. If you can talk to me, you obey everything I'm saying, that's a, that's a six. You get the best score you can. If I pinch you, you localize the pain, you grab my hand and say, ow, that's a five. If you would pull back from pain, so I start an IV on you, but you pull back, that's a withdrawal. That's a four. Flexion, so core to your body is a little bit better than away from your body. So decorticate posturing is a three. Decerebit's a two. And then if you get nothing, they're flaccid, that's a one. Okay. The worst score you can get on a GCS is a three, right? The worst score you can get on any of these is a one. So we've got a six-cylinder motor. And then the Jackson 5, I know I'm older, but that's the only thing that's got five people that I can think of. Um, but that's the way I was taught. The Jackson 5, I know you're older. Um, <laughs> says the man wearing his bifocals to read. So, <laughs> All right, so you go best verbal response. If you can tell me your orient, you can tell me a person, place, time, what's happened, that's a five. If you go down to... You can talk to me, but you're a little confused. You don't really know some of the things I'm asking you. That's a four. If you give me inappropriate words, I say, hey, what is, what is this? And you say, hey, it's Saturday. Or what is this? Well, yeah, that's a, a motor car. I don't know. I'm apparently having a stroke up here. Um, but that's inappropriate words. That's a three. If they're just moaning, groaning, not really doing anything verbally, that's a two. And if, again, there's no sound coming out whatsoever, it's a one. So we've got six cylinder motor, Jackson five, and four eyes. Okay. And with eyes, if they open their eyes spontaneously, they're looking around, that's a four. If their eyes are closed, but when you start talking to them, they open their eyes, that's a three. And then if they only open their eyes to pain, it's a two. Or if they don't open them at all, it's a one. Or, or at least do something purposefully. You're going to see people that have eyes kind of half open, but purposefully with their eyes. So our guy had a four. All right, so we've got GCS4 and an obvious, likely head injury patient. What do y'all want to do? Give him fluids, because if he has a bleed and his blood pressure is that high, you're going to overload the brain I, fluid. I disagree. Possibly. So Chief Ward is actually correct. So, there, and we're going to go over this in just a minute, but the number one thing you want to prevent, so we're trying to prevent that downstream effect. I can't affect it what he's got what's he had happened at this point he's already had his head injury but i prevented a downstream effect and so what is happening is with a blood pressure of 205 pulse of 48 respirations of four he's actually what's called the cushing's triad you heard that before so that's basically showing that he's in he's acutely likely herniating he's got severely increased icp so what's happening is yeah his blood pressure is really high but the blood flow to his dead Lord. But the blood flow to his brain is actually compromised. And so you're in a head injury patient, you're trying to help him out. You're trying to ensure that he doesn't get hypotensive. You're not flooding him. I agree. You're not flooding this guy, but you don't want to let him get hypotensive and you want to guard against neurological or spinal shock. Okay, does that make sense? So you're right. I'm not going to just go say, hey, three liters in this guy immediately. But I'm going to keep three liters at, at my side. Because he can decompensate quickly and go into neurogenic shock from both the spinal cord, a possible spinal cord injury or cranial injury. Okay. But you have to maintain good cerebral perfusion pressure. So you kind of want that pressure up a little bit for right now in the short term. Okay. I'm going to do things differently in the hospital. Yes, sir. The heart and lungs on the scene and things like that, it needs to be gone to the trauma room. That's an right. ongoing thing that we always preach, but as quick as we can get them inside that trunk and roll towards a facility yeah. with, a, with an airway, the better off. Correct. Yeah, I think that's a, 
that's a really major point for everybody, especially now that we're starting to manage medical scene, uh, critical medical patients for longer on the scene. Um, I think sometimes we get complacent about the trauma patients and head injury patients. I think all of our interventions pre-hospital probably need to be done in route. Yeah. And so I'm sure you're going to get to it, but I, I would think airway would be really important for this guy, airway and oxygenation. Airway is number one. So we go CAB on everybody now. We backed up to CAB. He doesn't have a life-threatening bleed, so we're very quickly on A. He's snoring, so he does not have a good patent airway. His airway is toast. But he's also breathing four times a year. So we need to control that. And the reason for that is he's going to have worsening intracranial pressure because of all that. And I'll, I'll go through some of the pathophysiology in a minute about that. So I, I agree. He needs an airway. I would monitor his blood pressure really closely. Do not let him get hypotensive at all right now. Okay. Um, so I agree. Don't flood him yet, but keep it, in, keep it beside you. Hey, Dr. Evans. Dr. Evans, I'm sorry to interrupt. So we've got a question, a couple of questions from internet land. Okay. One is, would mannitol on 3% saline help with this type of head injuries in the pre-hospital setting? I know we did that hypertonic saline study years back and it actually showed to make things worse. Yeah. Um, I don't know about the mannitol. So we use hypertonic a lot. We use both of them in, in the emergency department, but honestly, pre-hospital, You've already hit on it. I really think you've got to get that guy in front of a surgeon. Even an emergency room physician, we can do a little bit. I can temporize things, but I'm temporizing things for a couple hours. Well, he really needs is a surgeon. So anything you do pre-hospital, I, I don't think a mannitol and hot salts or hypertonic saline in the pre-hospital setting are warranted right now. I think your best drug you have for these are high-flow diesel. Get them in the hospital. You're well within that going hour. So that's a good segue to the next question, which is, what do you think about this patient as a candidate for air transport? My answer to that from an operational point of view is, depends entirely upon where the patient is. So oftentimes in the greater Birmingham area, we can get them to definitive care just as fast yeah. by ground, uh, unless there's some procedure that the air crew can do that we can't do, such as RSI. Right. Then, then I think it might be beneficial, but. Uh, we've actually been discussing this quite a bit internally at Center Point Fire, when we should, when we should not call for helicopter transport. And I think our, we've established some geographic boundaries. We've looked at some times for different agencies to get to us. And I think that the uh, entanglement or entrapment on the scene is a big, plays a big part in that. If they're, I think that they're entrapped, I think it's more reasonable that they're not entrapped. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I completely agree with what you're saying. If you're listening to this, podcast and you're in Birmingham, you're probably not calling for life flight. Now, if you start to get a little further away, because I live in Pell City, I use that as my reference point a lot. If you're in Pell City, maybe, maybe not. Depends on where your bird's coming from. It depends on how quickly you can get them out. If there's a wreck on I-20 and you know I have no way to get to UAB anytime soon, maybe. But what I would say, if you're, if you're out of the metro area, extremely reasonable to fly this guy. If you're in Tuscaloosa, you may fly him because you can get him in front of a neurosurgeon a little faster. Um, they do have theirs, but it's a different dynamic a little bit. So it, it just all depends on geography. It depends on conditions. And then again, if this is a person that's got snorts respiration, so we'll use our patient. Snorts respirations, breathing four times a minute, but he's clenched. I can't get his jaws open. I don't have RSI capability. I need them. Otherwise, he could very well arrest and route, and then I'm never going to get him back. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I agree. It's geography. It's can I get him there just as quick, and then do I need their intervention? And, again, if you're here in center point, I'm not going to call, even if his jaws are clenched, I'm just going to haul tail to the first hospital I can get to, preferably UAB because of neurosurgical capability. But we all know with the crashing patients, you have to do what you got to do to get some kind of airway. I think from here, you could be at UAB just as easily five minutes longer than going to like St. Vincent's East. But to have that neurosurgeon, which this guy needed, is, is really, really important. That could be St. Vincent's, Birmingham. That could be Grandview. I don't want to just harp on being UAB because they all have neurosurgery. But. So we've, we've got his airway. He, he tubed fine. We're bagging. 
for this guy specifically, well, we'll take back. We'll, we'll back up a little bit. We'll say any head injury patient that's GCS less than eight, we're going to consider intubation. How do you want to bag this guy? Not our patient, but a, let's say GCS of six, vital signs are much more stable. So it was category B for a long time, but yes. Yeah, it's kind of working its way out, but it's still, well, last I checked, it's still category B. Right, ventilation. It's not A. Yeah, so I, so I, I think that uh, there's no room for hyperventilation in these folks, because even if they're herniating, we're not going to save them. Um, uh, blowing off that CO2 is pretty bad for people. Yeah. So. Yeah. And you only get a temporary effect off the hyperventilation. So, yeah, and it kills the part of the brain that's still salvageable. So, <clears throat> so no hyperventilation. Do people do it? They do. Do they do it in the emergency department? They do. Do they especially do it in neurosurgical cases like anesthesia? They do. But pre-hospital, what I would highly recommend is nine times out of ten, you're bagging these guys at a rate of about eight. Eight to ten. And it's for everybody. I mean, eight to ten is reasonable for everybody. But especially these guys, because what I don't want to do is decrease their cerebral blood flow. If they have good vital signs, they're not showing this Cushing's triad, there's no reason <laughs> to hyperventilate them. Because what's going to happen, I didn't put a slide in, but I, this is a perfect time to talk about the pathophysiology of what happens. You hyperventilate somebody, you blow off a ton of their CO2. Well, the blood flow in your brain is dependent on your arterial CO2 level. So the higher the CO2, the more blood flow is coming to the brain. Strangely, the lower, see the, the lower the CO2, it constricts the arterioles in the brain, diminishes the blood flow. So that was the whole point of hyperventilation. I'm going to blow off a ton of CO2. The arterioles in the brain are going to constrict. I'm going to reduce the amount of pressure in the brain some. Not a lot, but some. Because blood flow in the brain counts for about 8% of the volume. If I can reduce some of that, I can reduce some of the pressure. But again, it's very temporizing. I agree with Dr. Ferguson. We're trying to maximize the salvageable brain. And if we've gotten to the point where they have this part, which is my hand, so this thing's the whole brain, this is the injured area, I'm going to do everything I can to maximize the rest of the brain to where it can, hopefully they're not as neurologically devastated. So I'm going to maximize my cerebral blood flow, but not hyperventilate these guys, make sure I'm bagging them a little slower I'm going to make sure that their blood pressure's good. So if they're hypotensive, I'm going to treat them like high. But the brain is not necessarily first to say, and this is my cause. You got to assume bad head injury, they may have internal, internal injury as well. So you're giving them volume. Now, there is neurogenic shock. We all know about that. But give the guys volume. Make sure they have a good pressure to perfuse. So if this guy's 60 over 40 pressure, fluids. Fluids. Okay. And the other thing is oxygenation. You don't want to flood them. We talked about it for years. Used to, it was everybody got O2. Now it's just maintaining oxygen saturation of, in these guys, 95% is, is reasonable. Okay. All right. Yes, sir. Hey, Dr. Evans. <clears throat> the only thing I would mention is that um, the cerebral fusion pressure has to be high enough uh, to overcome the intracranial pressure mm -hmm. and so the way you do that's with blood pressure or mean arterial pressure mm -hmm. and so it is worth noting i think that if you hyperventilate somebody generally that drops blood pressure so it's kind of mm -hmm. counterproductive so you're, you're kind of fighting against yourself and the other thing is is we all have qualitative capnography now <clears throat> and quantitative capnography so we can bag intubated patients with capnography and keep them in the normal range mm -hmm. without really worrying too much about rate right. in, in my opinion so i think i think we just need to remember to use our capnography on head trauma patients agreed. agreed so we've already innovated this patient you're gonna again everything's very quickly assess them real quick for a life that an injury you've innovated cut all their clothes off get them exposed get two large bore ivs and basically monitor for other sequela so monitor that that real hypertensive patient is not getting worse, not decompensating from a blood pressure standpoint, and get them to a trauma center. Okay. So these are your protocols. I'm not going to belabor this. You can read these pretty easily. Um, but 
what I do want to say is any ultra mental status patient, even this is a trauma patient, still do a blood sugar. Anytime we talk about ultra mental status, make sure and say, hey, he, he wrecked his motorcycle, bad head injury. And when we do the lab, we find out the sugar's 20, and that's why he wrecked his, his bike. So just as you're doing everything, just make sure you get a sugar on anybody that's altered at all, including Dr. Ferguson. All right, avoid secondary brain insults. This is just kind of the management pearls that we've already talked about, we've already harped on. Prevent hypotension, optimize cerebral oxygenation, so keep a SAD of 95 or so. Don't flood them with oxygen if they don't need it, because that causes other issues we've already talked about a ton. But you don't want them to become hypoxic, you don't want them to become hypotensive, and maintain a good blood sugar. If they have a blood sugar of 20, the brain tissue's not real happy in that setting either. So treat that as well. Keep the head of the bed elevated to about 30 to 40 degrees. Again, that's just going to cause gravity to allow some of the blood to flow out. Um, so you're not just giving them worse intracranial pressure. Exactly. Prevent hyperthermia because sometimes these head injury patients will become. And then monitor for herniation. But again, ain't a lot you can do. We can, you can call and we can have a conversation about hyperventilation if you want. But coming from Center Point Fire, coming from Birmingham Fire, man, it's not going to do much. You're going to have to do it for a few minutes to see a response. It only gives you a response for a couple hours. So there's just, I'd have a hard time saying let's let's do this in the pre-hospital setting for 99% of the cases. So I mentioned it, we talked about it, but that's, that's that. All right, and we'll just kind of fly through spinal trauma because I know y'all are, y'all heard us talk a lot. So again, most of the spinal trauma cases come from MBCs. Over 50% of them come from MBCs. About 8% of them come from diving injuries. Then the rest are from various things like falls, assault, other kind of blunt trauma things. Excuse me, this is an MRI. This is your spine. This is not supposed to be disconnected. So very bad. I think it's very, very important, not that you sit there and do real detailed neurological anatomy lesson, but to understand kind of what happens in these things, it's very important to know this is the general structure of, of a vertebral, vertebral body. So you've got the body of the vertebra here, you've got the part that you actually can feel is the spine of the verte vertebra, and then you've got kind of some wings or, or, or the processes, transverse processes coming off. In the middle of this hole, between all this that makes a big circle, is your spinal cord. It's, it's wrapped around, just like the brain, it has coverings, it has dura matter, it has an epidural space. But, it's not a ton of space in here. And you can imagine, if any piece of this impacts the spinal cord, there's not a lot we can do. I mean, it's, there's a ton of devastation that can happen from these injuries. But it, it depends on what part of the spinal cord hit as to what you're going to see. <clears throat> Sorry. And by that I'm saying is the front, you can see, is kind of the most well protected. That's the part that controls our movement. That's the part that controls um, our sensation to touch. And toward the front, kind of on the sides, that's where we'd sense pain and temperature. It's on the sides because, well, if it gets hurt and I can't sense pain or temperature, that's bad. It's not as bad as I can't move my leg or my arm. Okay? So, Front's most well protected, back kind of senses where you are in space, it senses vibration, um, just some things to keep you upright and moving. So if this gets fractured and you have a huge piece impact the front of the spinal cord, what's it going to get? What are you expecting it to mess with? Can't move, right, your motor function, correct, correct. And there's some other nuances, but we'll stick with motor, front, sensing things in the back of the spinal cord. All right, and you've got seven cervical vertebrae, that's your neck. If you feel this bump at the bottom of your neck, that's the transition point between the bottom of the cervical to the top of the thorax. And basically I'm telling you this because you can predict injury patterns, you can predict things, but it also makes you even sound a little bit better if you come in the trauma bag. Hey, he's got a defect at C7, T1 area. It makes you sound smarter. Okay, but seven cervical vertebrae, the bump right here is on most people it's T1, some people it's C7. So just know that's the transition point. You've got 12 thoracic vertebrae. They end 
about right here, lower back. You've got five lumbar vertebra, five fused sacrum. Everybody knows what your sacrum and your butt bone are. And then the coccyx kind of turns under. There are four little fused bones there. If you want to know levels, that'll kind of help. Nipple level roughly is about T4 in a lot of people. Belly button, give or take, um, is the transition point of your thoracic and your lumbar. And if you feel your iliac crest here, if you were to take your iliac crest and draw a line straight across, that's L3. So if you just want to kind of know where you are in the spine, those are some landmarks. Again, does it really, really matter? Not a lot, but just something to kind of, kind of keep it in mind, back of your mind. Makes your report sound cooler. What does matter is where the level of the injury, depending on things like this. So C345, the nerve roots of C345 keep the diaphragm alive. Those actually run the musculature of the diaphragm, and that's actually what helps initiate the breaths. So if you have a spinal cord injury that's super high, C1, C2, even C3, 4, you have a real high chance of this patient being on a ventilator for the rest of their life, or at least in the short term. Okay? So C4, you call them a quad. You injured this high, nothing below it's going to run, depending on what part of the spinal cord is impacted. So they're a quad or tetraplegic, but we call them quad most of the time. You can be a complete, meaning nothing works below that point. You can be an incomplete, meaning part of the spinal cord is impacted, but maybe they can have a little shoulder shrug. Maybe they can do some, have some sensation. So when you go to a patient, they say, I'm an incomplete quad. That just means something's still intact, and it may just be sensation. If you get down to C6, well, now they can move their shoulders. They can shrug a little bit, but they can't actually use their hands or, or their forearms. Sensation and motor stops about right here lower deltoid, upper brachial region. You get down to T6, well, that's about belly button, xiphoid process, and below, they're done. This is very important between a C6 and a T6, though. Your C6, I'm probably bed bound, probably can't sit upright, just depends. T6, I can sit in a wheelchair, I can push myself, I can live a normal life, I'm just not walking. And then when you get down to L6, we're you can't do anything and basically hips down, okay? And there are other spinal levels. you got sacral spinal levels, which you're going to be able to move, but maybe you're incontinent of your bowels. Maybe your manhood doesn't work. Something to that level, that's what the sacral nerves control, everything in the pelvic region. But you can still walk. You can still live a fairly normal life otherwise. So some signs and symptoms for these, when you're going on scene, you're trying to figure out, hey, does this guy have a spinal injury or not? And we're working our way toward treatment. You've got this guy on the motorcycle crash. He's unconscious. Let's say we go back. It's a different guy. He's conscious. He's just laying there. Does he have pain? So the first thing I would do is, hey, can you move anything? If they can, that helps. That tells me what may still be intact. But then I'm going to run the length of his spine. And I'm going to palpate from... The ineon or this bump on the back of your head all the way down to his bottom, to his butt bone. If he has midline tenderness, now we're not talking about if you get off lateral and they say, ow, that hurts, that's probably not, a, that's not necessarily a spinal injury. That's a muscle. But if you go along the spinous process, it's very midline of the back, and you're pushing and they say, ow, that hurts, or they actually physically scream out in pain, that's a little concerning. Now, I say that, but I want to caution you. A little trick that I like to use is get them talking about something else. Don't just walk up and say, does this hurt? Because if I go to anybody in this room and I poke with my four fingers in your spine, it's not going to feel good. That's just the nature of we're, we're hyper and we're kind of pushing. Does this hurt? Yeah, it hurts. You're pushing on my spine, man. But if you get them talking about the accident and you just kind of press on these spots, they're distracted about something else. If it truly hurts, They'll stop you and they'll say, man, that feels awful. Okay, I'm worried about your spinal cord at that point. If you're able to distract them and run the spine, I'm not as concerned. And we're not talking about distracting injury. We're talking about, I have you talking about a, an MVC. I have you talking about your kids. And if you don't respond, that's a good thing. Okay? 
The next thing is if they say they have tingless numbing or they have truly overt weakness of a part of their body, that's super concerning. Um, loss of sensation or paralysis below where you suspect their injury site is. Impaired breathing, again, that's C345, runs the diaphragm. If they're incontinent, if they've pooped or peed on themselves, that's a concerning thing. But you don't see it as often, but one really concerning thing is if they have a priapism, they have an erection. Um, that shows that there's very likely a spinal cord injury somewhere. And we use all these to determine, do they need to be immobilized or not? So very quickly run through anterior cord syndrome. That's where that, that big vertebral body impacted the front of this cord. And so I'm expecting motor problems. And you can also lose some pain and temperature just the way they cross, but it doesn't matter a ton. I just want you all to know it's a thing. That's anterior cord syndrome. You've got central cord syndrome. These are the people who get a hyperflexion, so they dive in the pool, their neck gets thrown back, they have a football injury, again, neck gets thrown back. Anything that makes a hyperextension injury can cause central cord. And the reason I tell you this is these people can overall be okay. Over, basically, you look at them and say, man, it's fine, I don't really have a ton of injury. But for some reason, their upper arms are weaker than their lower their legs. They have some issues with sensation. Then you worry about some of these other things like a central cord syndrome. Your management's gonna be very, very similar, right? They have, a, they have a deficit and we gotta get them to the hospital. Then you got Brown's cord. This is a lot of times where somebody is stabbed or you have a penetrating injury that hits half your cord. If you remember, there's two sides of the cord. If I only hit half of it, then what I'm, what's gonna happen is on that side where they got hit, you're going to have loss of motor, vibratory, and sensation. But on the other side of where they got hit, they'll say, yeah, I can't move my right leg, but it's weird. I can't feel pain or temperature on my left leg. I can still move it, but it just, you put a hot poker to it and you can't feel it. And it's just the way the neural paths cross. Then you have what's final one is very important for us. Is called a quinine. Spinal cord usually terminates in the L2 region. And past the L2 region, this is your spinal cord terminating here. You have a bunch of nerve fibers that run the legs, run the perineum. <clears throat> and it's called the conoquinine, which means horsetail. And this tr quite literally looks like a horsetail as it's coming out. If you get in conoquinine syndrome, it can be from a bony abnormality. So something is broken down there and pushing against these nerves. Or... You have somebody that's got an acute rupture of their, their disc and it's pushing on those nerves. The symptoms you'll have are they'll have a little bit of pain, maybe a lot of pain, but more importantly, they're going to be very numb in their saddle region. And you imagine if you sit on a saddle, any part that would touch the saddle, inner thighs, perineum, scrotum, anus, it, they'll have diminished sensation there. You could have priapism, but more important, you have some bowel or bladder issues. Either they're going to pee or poop on themselves. They may say, yeah, this is real numb and I hadn't peed in the day. That's also concerning as well. It's just impacting the nerves that run this region. That needs to get to a hospital ASAP because that's going to need to be in front of a spinal surgeon ASAP or else this is going to be a permanent issue. So management. So what Gage and DeSoto do? Everybody would just get as much of a, you get on a long spine board, you mobilize and you just, Hot-footed, right? We're 21st century. So we talk about these things, but I, I, the whole point of the spinal converse, conversation is we want to avoid immobilization as much as possible. There have been a lot of studies over the last several years to determine do they need C collars, do they need long spine boards. Well, long spine boards... It was made, and it's not a terrible idea when it was made, but it's a flat board. We are not flat people, okay? So you've got all this curvature in your back laying against the board. You're not getting much immobilization there. If you truly have to immobilize somebody, you need to pad these areas, these voids. Ideally are the sandbags and, and kind of the, the mattresses that will suck around a patient. That's actually, I'm not going to argue on that one too much. That's actually really good. I don't know anybody that has anybody. Do you, heard those sandbags? <laughs> Maybe. But so long spine boards, 
realistically are terrible for immobilization. They actually cause worse immobilization than if you just put them on your stretcher. This is talking about proper utilization of C collars. It's a good face hole. You can get to his airway right real good. And then this is the number one thing that we all see. We'll put it on perfectly, and you turn around, the patient kind of wheeled his way down and got it up around his mouth, occluding his airway. Um, so what I say is if you have to use a cervical collar, and the big if is this one. If you have to use a cervical collar, make sure it fits. Make sure it actually does what it's supposed to. It's not too big and hyperflexing. The person you're really concerned about a cervical injury or too big to where they can do this or this. And then if you see somebody coming in in a soft collar, just walk away. They're trying to call Shannara. That's, there's no fit in this right here. Okay. So again, studies have shown in the 21st century that they're really a mobilization. People are really smart. They can self-splint. So we used to just throw collars on people and backboards. My teaching when I went through in the early 2000s, it was, hey, everybody got packaged fully. Well, now we're getting away from that. Spine boards, there should almost be no reason to use a spine board unless you've got to get them transported from the scene to the car. They're moving a patient. But when you get to the stretch, you need to probably get them off of that board. That's what I would highly recommend. Because not only are they really bad at immobilization, they're so hard, you're going to cause some pressure and skin breakdown, which causes other issues down the road. And then I'm, on, I'm kind of on the fence on cervical collars. They are useful in truly needed scenarios. But again, most people, if they're conscious alert, they can self-splint. They're going to sit there on a stretcher, and they know if I move my neck this way, it hurts. They're not going to move their neck. I'm not going to put it on them. There are only a few instances where I think a a cervical collar is warranted. <clears throat> so when to immobilize these guys? If you have an unreliable patient, so they're heavily intoxicated, so I can't trust my exam, and I have a high suspicion that they actually did something. Now then you get into having them put it on and keeping it on, it becomes another issue. But if there's also a communication or language barrier, so what I tell residents and what I tell people that I work with at the emergency department, if I can't talk to you, we don't speak the same language, or um, there's a cognitive deficit, I take my treatment one step further than I normally would. So 20-year-old guy, I can talk to you, I can figure out what's going on, I'm going to do X treatment. Probably not going to mobilize, but if it's an 80-year-old demented patient, an intoxicated patient, or somebody that unfortunately doesn't speak the same language where I can't get a good exam from that standpoint, I'm going to go one step further. That's somebody I would consider a mobilization. And by mobilization, most of the time I mean in a cervical collar, not a long spine board. If they truly have a distracting injury, that's another thing that kind of makes them an unreliable patient. But I'm not saying that this is just an hysterical person or they've got a bump on their leg. They may even have a terrible looking leg fracture that doesn't necessarily make a distracting injury. If they can follow with your exam and they follow with your conversation, that's not a distracting injury. But if they're so hysterical from their foot being sheared off, okay, then they become an unreliable patient and you go one step further than you normally would. And the one that we talk about most in the protocols is if they have a hard neurological deficit or point midline spinal tenderness. You've distracted them a little bit by talking about other things and you push and it's, a, it's in the cervical region and you're really concerned that they have a true cervical injury. Okay, cervical collar, when you come in with it, be like, hey, this is what happened. Well, okay. We're good. I'll feel we'll get a shot real quick and we'll figure out if they have some. So focal numbness, tingling, use caution. People say, I got hit in my leg and this is numb. I don't go so much off the numb tingling, but if they can't move their leg, that's that's one I usually will go real hard for. And I'll I'll put a circle collar on. Long spine board, basically these are guys, honestly, the only time I'd use it if they're paralyzed, can't help you, you need to move them to the stretcher, I'll use it then. But again, as soon as you can get them off the board, I would. It's something that I wouldn't necessarily stake your license on it, but this is stuff that we use in the emergency department to determine, do I need to do anything further? And basically, it's two things that talk about it. Are they a reliable patient? So on nexus spine criteria, do they have a mechanism that you're concerned about spinal trauma? Are they awake alert? Can they talk to me? If it's yes, then you move down. If it's no, 
they're an unreliable patient and you kind of take the precautions you need. But if they're awake alert, do they have a focal injury, painful distracting, midline spinal tenderness? And if any of these are answered yes on this part, possible spine injury, you want to, for this it drives where they need to image them, but it would also drive where they need to immobilize them as well. So, but again, don't, this is an idea of something to look at, to utilize from time to time, but don't let it guide your care because it's not meant for the pre-hospital setting. Okay. I just wanted to show you all some of the things that we talk about. Things to think about if you have to pad, if you have to mobilize a child on a long spine board, they're going to require padding up under their shoulders. They got big old noggins and not so big shoulders. So their head is going to be flexed forward a little bit more than you need. So make sure you pad them. Adults often need some level of padding under their head. That's why if you buy the foam blocks, it has an a inch and a half pad that comes with it. And then <laughs> expect an immobilized patient to throw up the second you put them on board. So strap them down really, really tightly because you're not going to be able to just say, hey, get up and throw up. You're going to have to physically take the board while maintaining C-spine and roll the board over to allow them to vomit so they don't aspirate. And again, remote, remove the patient from the long spine board as soon as possible. It goes in a neurogenic shock. I'm going to stop here. I think y'all have kind of dealt with me long enough. Um, but again, if you have severe neurological impairment or strong suspicion of spinal cord injury, consider mobilization. Limit long spine board usage. Avoid the C-collar unless medically indicated. Don't just throw it on because they've had a wreck and said, ow, my neck hurts, because it may be a lateral neck pain. That doesn't get a C-collar. That's a cervical strain. That's not a spinal injury. Avoid hypotension in these patients and monitor for neurogenic shock, which just to kind of go back to that for half a second, Neurogenic shock, if it's hypovolemic or hypo, uh, um, hemorrhagic, you're going to expect their blood pressure is down, their pulse is up. And neurogenic shock is, is the opposite. Their pulse is down with their blood pressure. So if both things are, are low, it's a probable distributive shock. Okay, They don't have the nerves running back to their heart saying, hey, I can't get my blood pressure up. Can you beat faster? So that's what I'm talking about there. Any questions? Hey, it was great, great lecture. Thank you, Dr. Evans. A couple of things that came up where we get these uh, trauma outcome reports back from TCC. And uh, just briefly, a couple of things that show up on that. Sometimes we see the term neurostorming. Sometimes we see the abbreviation CHI block mm -hmm. and SAH and DAI. I think you covered some of those. But so DAI is the diffuse axon injury. SAH is subarachnoid hemorrhage. Child block, I was actually going to throw it in here, but it's closed head injury, brief loss of consciousness. That's generally a minor head injury. Usually, right? yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and then neurostorming, what is neurostorming? Neurostorming, and Ferguson, you can probably talk a little bit more on this, but it's essentially where your brain can't regulate things very well. So you can't regulate your temperature, you can't regulate your pressure very well. Um, and it's, it's not necessarily there's an issue distal. It's all intracranial. And we manage it with a bunch of different things. We basically put it on cooling blankets and all. Um, but it's just your body has lost the ability to regulate various things, like temperature, like pressure, um, heart rate. It's not good. No, it's very bad. Not good. Not good at all. You said neurostorming. They probably did the new world. Yeah. Hey, well, thank you, Dr. Evans. Thanks, Dr. Ferguson. Great lectures today. We ran a little bit over. Apologize for that, everybody. Remember, you have to fill out an attendance form to get your certificate emailed to you. I put a direct link to the attendance form in the chat feature a couple of times. The password for today's class is protocol. If you can't access that direct link, please send an email to alabamaemschallenge at gmail.com. You'll get an automated reply with a link for the attendance form. So if you attended, please fill out our attendance form, even if you don't need the CEUs, and we're providing CEUs for registered nurses now as well. Dr. Person, you got anything in closing? Nope. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. See you next time.